Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. As we look out these incredibly beautiful windows, we see white pillows of fog out these windows. So just imagine if you were Sir Francis Drake about 400 years ago and you're sailing up the coast, could you see the entrance to this bay if you were a couple miles offshore? I don't think so. So it's perfect that we arrange this weather today because it completely fits our topic and our speaker. So he wasn't born here in San Francisco Bay, and he wasn't born off the coast hunting for this opening. He started in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They know something about fog there, too. He moved to Southern California in the early 60s, and in 1985, moved up to Oregon. That would be important because it would be a few years later that a museum director up there asked him some questions about Indians, and then he began to be interested in an old set of inscriptions from some European hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that begins to open the question about when and if Sir Francis Drake landed on our coast. Many of us who sailed outside the gate know that the farther out you go from the Golden Gate, the more it just closes up behind you. Even though the bridge is several hundred feet tall, 400 feet, you can't see the towers by the time you get out to the Fairlawns. Even on a clear day, it's very difficult to see them. And they, the, the, the whole shoreline kind of closes up on a bright, sunny day. On a foggy day like this one right here, it's completely understandable that he or anybody else sailing up and down the coast in an old galleon in the 1500s would not have seen the entrance to San Francisco Bay. But the question remains, did he find a, a place to berth his boat and heel it over and replace the copper bottom up on Drake's Bay? We call it Drake's Bay. So I couldn't find a better source than the historian and the author who will speak today. So please welcome historian author Gary Gitson. Gary, come on up. Thanks, Ron, for that uh, wonderful uh, opening. Uh, you know, you're making it kind of tough on me. But uh, <laughs> first thing I like to do is introduce, introduce my wife and also editor is uh, Peg Miller. And she's been that way for 26 years. I couldn't do this without her. And then I'd like to introduce Janet and uh, Dave Buchanan. Or, I'm sorry, Dave, Rich Buchanan. And uh, <laughs> I we, we, well, I, don't ha I have no idea. Uh, we, were, uh, we were there, Peg and I were there guests at the uh, Marines Memorial uh, Hotel last evening. And uh, the reason why we're there is because uh, Rich is also a holder of the uh, uh, Navy Cross. So, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I like to start with this little quote here, and uh, it's rather interesting. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, I have another guest here. He's from Sacramento, and he came up and visited us up in uh, uh, Oregon uh, last summer, and this is uh, Kevin uh, Woodruff. Yeah. So, thanks. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, it's been really wonderful to be here. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, working on this and thinking about this for about six or eight months, and if you've ever been married or had a baby that far out, uh, the baby is finally here, so, uh, <laughs> and it's wonderful. And my, uh, my uh, editor asked me uh, just a couple of days ago, she, uh, this is on my desk, this, uh, this, this saying, and she said, do you know who said that? And I said, no, I don't know who said that. And so I looked it up, and I, I found out that... Uh, uh, Texas Ranger. Some, I just love being a Texas Ranger, and uh, and I feel like I would I would go into hell with a bucket of water too. So, especially after that in, in invite too. So let's see if I can uh, start the next one. I'm actually the current president of the Sir Francis Drake Association of, in, in Oregon. In fact, Rich Buchanan is the president of the Sir Francis Drake Association in California, and uh, I've written I've written uh, nine books that I can remember, and a number of. Uh, Number, number of articles, thank you, which you can access on Academia EDU, and it's a really wonderful site, quite honestly. It helps people get their information out there before they have to wait for 10 months for having an article produced like I had one produced in the Terra Incognita. And this is the book I've written uh, that's uh, showing Francis Drake and the Halen Bay, surprise. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, I show you where I live. In, in Wheeler, Oregon, and also the uh, Neoconi Mound there, which is the, the uh, incised rocks that Ron mentioned that the, that the uh, 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 museum director had uh, first theorized that Drake had been in the Halen Bay or Neoconi Mountain. 
this may be a little small for some, but there's other things to follow. So, but what it says is that uh, uh, it's hard to believe or change your mind, find, find your mind changed after you had, had been indoctrinated for so long, especially seeing as we have a bay for him and a, uh, a, uh, a road for him and, uh, and, 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 ch- and schools for him. And this is the book that, you, that I've always used. It's the journal, copy of the journal. And it's 1628, it was, it was, uh, it was first published. And you have to remember that uh, the reason why there was a lot of mystery behind this whole thing is because when Drake got back, the queen confiscated everything having to do with the, with the, with the voyage. And, uh, and under pain of death for releasing any information is what she really put out. So that's the reason why this book was, wasn't printed until after she died. And this book was printed in 1628. In fact, this is the only copy that I will use, the only copy I will suggest, because all the other ones have been edited. And these were, this was done by Francis Fletcher, a, a member of the uh, voyage. And I swear to you, in the next 60 minutes, uh, you will see no evidence that Drake claimed California. No. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> And, 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 as Ron, and as Ron mentioned, that uh, a friend of mine told me that uh, there was Indians on the, on the coast when I moved to Oregon in 1985. And I said, oh, really? I said, where can I find out about that? And he says, go down and see the guy at the museum down there. And this is the guy who was at the museum. And he first said that Drake had made a survey on the Akani Mountain. And, and um, he didn't figure that out until 1971, actually. So it was relatively new. And he never really wrote much. Uh, Wayne was a local boy and from Tillamook County. Tillamook has 42,000 people in the entire county. It's 60 miles. Pardon? 4,200? 42,000. Did I say 4,200? I'm very sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, oh, I could tell that joke about G- George Burns now, but I'll tell that later. Yeah. <laughs> George Burns said, if you, want, if you want to have a wonderful marriage, tell your wife before you go to bed everything you did all day long in the minute detail. And he said, she'll let you know everything you did wrong. <laughs> but that's why I have an editor. <laughs> and I love it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. Uh, how, do, how did the plate of brass begin? And these are two men, and that's one of the preambles that I passed up. These are the two men who were the most powerful in the state as far as making a decision on how Drake started in, in California. The first one is, is, is Robert Greenhow. He was the librarian for the U.S. Department, the Federal U.S. Department of State, and he said that Drake never went further than 43 degrees. And why he said that was because the United States was trying to own the Oregon Territory. So, of course, they didn't want to say that Drake went further than that. So that's how Oregon became Oregon Territory. And then the next person was... George Davidson. George Davidson was the was the U.S. surveyor for uh, Washington, Oregon, California, all the way down to Mexico, all the way up to the British Columbia, and he said that he had to put the the uh, Drake's Bay at 38 because that's what it said in the journal. That's what it said in here, and the reason why it said that was because one of the reasons why Drake had this voyage was he was to claim lands no uh, or no other. Uh, uh, a Christian country had claimed, and so he knew that from captured maps that the that the uh, French, Spanish would, would try to come in at 38 degrees uh, from the Philippines and then sail south to Acapulco, and Drake said he was up to 48. So he actually claimed between 48 and 38 degrees, and that's the right why uh, George Davidson had to put it at 38 when he totally ignored the Indians and he totally ignored the flora and fauna, and that's one of the reasons why if you've ever studied anything about Drake. In California, nothing talks about the f- flora or fauna or the, or the uh, um, whatever else there was. And so, <clears throat> or the Indians. And then the Drake landing in California uh, needed an archaeological proof because up until that time, it was just theory, okay? Oh, by the way, let me, what is that? Is that rain? Pardon? Oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, But one of the things I wanted to mention about um, uh, Greenhow and um, uh, Davidson was they were involved with the Limitor uh, Estro, if you're familiar with Limitor. And uh, uh, Limitor was a captain, and he owned uh, most of San Francisco, and he owned hundreds of thousands of acres in the area because the the Spanish had given him that many acres because he had crashed his, his ship out here. And they, 
they traded the acreage, which was worth nothing, uh, for the cargo. And what happened was that uh, that uh, um, Davidson and um, Greenhow came, and they said that it wasn't legal. Uh, Davidson said it was a bad a bad seal, and Greenhow said no, that that wasn't any good. And and a, and a small thing about that is Greenhow died in San Francisco because he slipped off of one of the one of the um, a wooden bank, one of the wooden uh, uh, sidewalks, and he ended up dying. So I guess bad karma for him. Anyway, the uh, plate of brass wasn't real until they they found a, a a plate of brass, and there it is. I got this right out of the Bancroft Library. Actually, I'm lying. This was made by the Francis Drake. Navigators Guild, and this was made in 1962. They made a lot of uh, replicas, and that's what this is. And the replicas were made originally were made by George Barron, who was the director of the of the uh, D. Young Museum over in Oakland, and his friend, who was a neighbor of his, George Clark. And during the time that uh, <clears throat> George Barron had been laid off uh, for various reasons, that's when the plate was made, and that's why they put it in San Francisco Bay out there where you could see uh, that prison and uh, <laughs> and uh, because because de young michael de young uh, thought that drake was in San, or in uh, drake's bay so so they had it put in san francisco bay oddly enough someone said wait a second uh, we found that plate before before 1936 <laughs> only we threw it away and it was actually found in drake's bay so Two people were sort of like telling stories here, and they paid for the pay. The uh, Bancroft Library paid thirty-five hundred dollars for it in 1936, and uh, oddly enough, that turns into seventy-five thousand in 2023. And that's the reason why the plate of brass is still sitting at the entrance of the Bancroft Library, although it does say that it's a fake now. I shouldn't have blown my cover there right off, but in 1936. Uh, Herbert Bolton, who was the director of the of Bancroft Library and also the the uh, director of the history at, at uh, Berkeley, uh, said that the, the artifact was the greatest thing they ever found in California, and it was Drake's land claim. Well, because he had so much power and so much influence, people believed it. And one of his students in 1942, uh, Robert uh, Heitzer, said that the language that Drake heard was Miwok, and it was conclusive that it was the Miwok language that he heard. Now, I know what this says, and it was not Miwok language, quite honestly, but because Chester Nimitz was the um, speaker or the, uh, the representative of the Drake Navigators Guild from the beginning in 1946 until 1966, everyone believes, a, a, everyone believes a, a, an admiral. I mean, I would. So, I mean, there's no problem with that. But what happened, it went to the California State Historical Resource Commission in 1974 to 1976, and those are the people who make decisions on whether plaques are put up in the state, said, you all, you know, you all know how to read. It says it would take a leap of faith to believe that Drake was in any bay in California. In fact, there were three different people who made presentations to them. One was for San Francisco Bay, one's, one was for Bodega Bay, and another one was for Drake's Bay. And that's why they came up with this statement. Not me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, the Bancroft Library, uh, James Hart with the 400-year with the, uh, anniversary of Francis Drake uh, coming to uh, the North Coast, uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to find out whether, whether the uh, plate of brass was real. And of course, uh, he said a couple of things, but beyond beyond a doubt, it was it was of recent origin. And he said the reason why they did two of them is because uh, they wouldn't believe the first one. In fact, I was at the uh, Library of Congress in the rare book room when uh, when uh, um, uh, Mike uh, uh, Din Dinunation walked in and asked me what I was doing, and I told him I was doing some Drake research. And he said, "Oh, I was at the bank. I was at the Bancroft at that time." And he was the chief, by the way, of that of that. Uh, that room at the uh, Library of Congress, and he says, you should have heard those people hollering and carrying on, that they saying that it wasn't a fake. He, he was laughing about that. He was a very nice man. And so did Drake really, did Drake really land in California or was it in Oregon? 
the Honduras map, the world encompassed, the John Drake cous his cousin, and the Edward Wright uh, world map are some of the really primary reasons of why he was not in California. Sorry, folks. <laughs> the Honduras map, uh, which was done in about 1589, has four different little cartouches. The one in the upper left-hand corner is what's called the Portus, Pla Portus Nova Al Al Albionis. And Nova, Nova means new. Albionis is an old name that the uh, Romans gave to England, so it's an old name for England. And so when Drake claimed the land, he called it Nova Albion, or New England. And this is a picture of, of the bay. So let's compare it to some of the top contenders. Whale Cove, uh, one of my friends in, in uh, Oregon says it was a whale cove. Uh, other people have said it was Point Reyes, uh, Drake's Bay, Drake's Cove, Drake's Estro, uh, or Nahalem Bay. This is the prettiest picture I could find of, of, uh, of Whale Cove. I've been on Whale Cove. I've been on some of the digs down there, too. Uh, I don't dig, by the way. Uh, and Drake's, or Whale Cove is only an eighth of a mile cross. The world encompassed says it was three quarters of a mile across. I can only go by this. I can't go by anything else. And, and, and they found nothing as far as any uh, archaeological evidence. So uh, Whale Cove is out. Sorry. And then there's, uh, <laughs> then there's uh, uh, Whale Cove, or excuse me, uh, Drake's Cove, which is the prop popular one, really, uh, suggested by the Drake Navigators Guild. And this is a page out of their book from 2000. And <laughs> I, know, I hope no one can read that ha-ha-ha where I put it on there when I first read this uh, because uh, uh, the, 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 uh, they're only a third of a mile across the cove. And so um, it's not three-quarters of a mile. It's, it comes up pretty short, which is rather interesting. I had a conversation with the president all, all about eight or ten years ago, the president of the, of the guild, and uh, we talked for about two and a half hours, and he finally said, the Halem Bay is too big. Yeah, well, the Halem Bay is three-quarters of a mile across. So it might be too big for Drake's Co, but it's not not for Portus Albionis. And here's an overlay of of, of uh, Halen Bay. And so my book, uh, Francis Drake and Halen Bay, a revised edition was in 2011 for a couple of reasons, uh, have, has uh, is not disputed, quite honestly. Uh, if you read that little preamble that I gave you. Um, there's are, there are things that uh, the that people have said about it that just are true. What can I say? What historians are saying. One of them is Herb Beals. I knew Herb. He died a number of years ago. But he said uh, he expected a fusillade of, of, of words. And I, I thought that was a great, great word that he said. And that was from ships and uh, firing at you. And those people have never fired at me. Uh, I've asked them to do, do uh, 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 talks three different times, and I've been turned down three different times. Why would I be turned down? Here you are. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, James Delgado. Uh, I don't know if you know, know James out in Texas A&M. He's going to another university now, but he greatly admired my book. I don't, I, don't, I don't solicit people, by the way. They read the books, and... They give me their opinion of it. And this is one of the, uh, the, the newest one I, I've gotten in the last, let's just say, month or so. Uh, Catherine uh, Delano Smith, uh, she's a senior research fellow at the Royal Geographical Society and the former editor of, of Amigo Monday. And I submitted articles to them, but I never write quite as well as they do in the UK. Uh, but uh, her and I have, have spoken, and she really loved the book, and she's trying to figure out what to do with, with it, uh, not to throw it in the trash, of course, but uh, really to further along with it. So maybe I'll, I'll be giving one more talk in the U.K. someday. I've always expected a, a call from the Queen, honestly. <laughs> but she died, so maybe Philip. Uh, Harvey Steele is a former, former uh, uh, archaeological society editor and president, and this is what Harvey had to say, he said the book was magnificent. What he said was no one had ever done what he had seen, and he used to go to some of the Drake Navigator Mills, uh, meetings. He said no one has ever seen word for word, in, like in my book, uh, 
with along with the with the with the uh, uh, with the with with this book here, with with the world encompassed. There's 19 pages in here of Drake's um, of Drake's landing, and out of the 108, and I've gone through every every word in there and compared it with with Nahalem Bay. Legitimately, I don't use flowery language, as you can tell. And uh, where's Nahalem Bay? Some of you might know and some of you might not know. It's 37 miles south of the Columbia River. It's a little bay, three quarters of a mile across, on the Oregon coast. On the back of my card, I have this little insert on the left here that shows Nova Elbion. And this map, by the way, is the only map, as it says there, with the Queen's privy seal on it. During her reign, there, are, there was no other map that had this. By the way, Edward Wright was the author of this map, and this was the first map done under, under the um, um, Mercator's projection. You're all sailors here. You all know what project, Mercator's projection is, although Drake was sailing under the plain chart method. And if you know what the plain chart method was, that's what they did in the 16th century, Latitudes, latitude is 60 degrees, longitude is 60 degrees, it's 60-60. So when he got back, by the way, Edward Wright was the Queen's uh, cartographer. In 1588, uh, he was sent to the, to the Azores to develop the first English maps for England because up until that time, they were all Spanish or Portuguese. And so he, he took this Drake's map or Drake's uh, book and if you know it, you have plain chart methods. Now, we all know that, that Washington and Oregon are pretty much uh, right along with the meridians if you're sailing under the state straight method or straight navigator's method. And so when you start using the Mercator method, as you get closer to the poles, they start to come in closer, those meridians. And what happened when it came in closer, it tilted the the the, t the, uh, the shore of, of um, Oregon and Washington, and that's why it's tilted to the left. If we were on the east coast, it would be tilted to the right. So it took me a long time to work on this and figure this out. And by the way, this, is, this map is in the, in the Hakluyt um, principal navigation and voyages. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Hakluyt, but uh, he was the collector of early navigation and, and uh, exploration. And this one was done in 1599. This map was in the 1599-1600 uh, edition. And uh, Helen Wallace, who was the, was the map curator at the, at the British Museum, said this was the most authentic map of anything that, that Hackley had ever printed. And so, and so the Spanish, as it says in the World Encompass, were never even so close to this. They were many degrees south. Well. The Halen Bay is at 45 degrees. Many degrees south would not be at 38 degrees like this here. They'd have to, he'd have to be like a down at 32 degrees. So they were saying that he was many degrees south. That's what it says in the, in the, in the, in the journal. And the only ones who were here earlier were the Cabrillo Ferrillo uh, expedition of 1542 and 43. Some of you may know about that. And they reached as high as Cape Mendocino at about 40 degrees. They only landed at San Miguel, where they buried Cabrillo, uh, and then returned to Acapulco. So, and no one else was here. When I say here, I mean Oregon. Sorry, folks. Uh, why is California Drake? Why is uh, California Drake's Bay at 38? Uh, why would Drake have captured, uh, or, or he had captured Spanish charts. He knew that they were coming in and tried to cite the land at 38 degrees. Now, we're at 37 plus here it's at, uh, at uh, San Francisco Bay, and Drake's Bay is at 38. So, let's talk about the land Drake really did claim as Nova Elbion. Nova Elbion had white banks in the journal and cliffs. It does not say cliffs and white banks, which so many people have used because Drake's Bay has white cliffs. I'm sorry. It says white banks, which is sand banks, which you can see from the picture that I took with my dog, and it's, a, it's one of those panoramics. So you start. 
start, you start here. Yeah, yeah, I can, I'll just turn it. You can start here, and you go. That's how you get the mo ocean on both sides. Okay. And then there's a picture from the top of Neokani Mountain showing the mountain and then the white banks. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Actually, my little red dot doesn't work on these monitors. So, uh, and then, whose land survey you? That's the very first line on the second page in this book. Drake was surveying the land that he was claimed for England. And uh, in, the, in the journal, it says that they, the Indians were very strong compared to his men, which are young men you know, sailing around the world. Uh, and he said uh, uh, it was uphill and downhill in English Mile. And that's what we're showing here on this, this survey that uh, Phil Costagini of Oregon State did back in about 1985. And this is a 184-page thesis. And some of the things that, that, that mean something, as you see Wayne Jensen here uh, talking about the rhomboid, uh, uh, showing, show, well, rhomboid, rom, roms, which are navigation marks. Uh, we're talking about the, the W rock, which is talking about triangulation. We're talking about the raised rock, which is on page 49 of my book, by the way. And uh, <laughs> just remember that one. And because it's a very important rock. And then probably the most important rock is the Monument Rock. And here you can see that Monument Rock being excavated by uh, Wayne Jensen's uh, friend. And this was back in about 1982 or so, something like that, maybe a little bit earlier than that. I forget right off the top of my head, but I think 82 is about it. And what you're really seeing here is the top of the 36 inch uh, measurement rock. So it's on three different sides. So the top is like about so, lot, so so big and then about so big. And it's all fashioned. It's a, it's a rectangular rock. That rock did not just happen by itself. And it was sitting on top of a cairn. And a cairn that was 10 feet around and two feet high of stacked rocks. And this sat on top of it at one time. And over the course of either the earthquake of 1700 or this large root coming out of the spruce tree knocked it over. By the way, uh, that, root, that root tree in my book talks about 850 years old uh, because the way you carbon date things is by the age of the, of the start of something. So the entire tree was 850 years old, not that root, and, but the tree was 850 years old. So by the time you get a root that large, it's about 400 years in my, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Oh, Sam Balfe said that the survey may be the most important Elizabethan artifacts in North America. Sam Balfe was, uh, he actually wrote a couple of books about Drake's voyage. And uh, he, um, he was a member of, of the uh, uh, government up there, off the top of my head. And so let's talk about the native language and culture. Fireweed. The Indians burnt off Neokani Mountain. And the reason why they burnt it off is because they did for two reasons. Number one, they wanted to grow fireweed because fireweed grows after a burn. And this fireweed, according to the <laughs> plate of, or the um, world encompass, says it was a herb much like lettuce. And I, that's why I put these pictures up on the top there going to seed because it's much like lettuce. And it had the finest down they ever found, that he ever found. Uh, I'm sorry, but in California, they, they use the thistle, which doesn't look anything like a herb or lettuce, nor is a thistle very fine down. So there are some things that California offers not very well. Uh, then the Halem Indians, uh, it says in the journal that uh, only the upper class, so to speak, could, could use the fine down. And here there's three different locations where you can see this fine down grown. And I was at the... Uh, Smithsonian, oh, I don't know, maybe eight or ten years ago in, in Maryland, which you have to have an, uh, an appointment to go to. And uh, I saw some of the, some of the things that, uh, that Wilkins, uh, or Wilkes, uh, uh, collected uh, up in the Northwest when he was there. If you're familiar with Wilkes, it was in the 1840s. And it was beautiful work done with cedar and uh, feathers and this down. And uh, <laughs> that's how the Smithsonian got started because he brought back so many samples uh, they had, to, they had to figure out what to do with it, so they started the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pretty interesting, huh? And then the World Compass talks about pata, pita, pata. How are we going to pronounce it? 
these are English people in the 1600s trying to write this out. But the Nehalem Salish language is Wapatu. And everyone knows what Wapatu is there. I was at the uh, uh, Oregon Archaeological Society. It was about 150 people there. And I said, how many people here have eaten Wapatu or Patu? And about half of them raised their hands because it is sweet when it's raw or it's sweet when it's baked. And uh, Professor Heitzer uh, said that was the Miwok language called Creed. I don't know where he got that name, I'm sorry. And he says the acorns, which uh, the Sermanos people were eating uh, when they crashed into Drake's Bay in uh, 1595, said they were eating acorns and they were bitter. So this is an interesting one. Uh, you know, there was never any smoking in England uh, before Drake got back. And uh, the Indians were known to uh, smoke uh, wild tobacco. And uh, they called it taba. And, and there's 250 different varieties of wild tobacco. By the way, it's illegal to grow tobacco in, in, in the United States. You can grow weed, but you can't grow tobacco. Uh, but it's, they were smoking it then. In fact, uh, um, trying to think of his name. I just can't remember his name off the top of my head. Jewett, John Jewett up in BC after his ship was uh, uh, um, burnt by um, McQuinnon. Uh, he was one of the only people left there and he said he saw the Indians uh, uh, cultivating tobacco by making it sweeter. And then here's a great one. <laughs> no one ever figured out what, what a much like a cooney, which is what this says here, and having a tail like a rat and webbed feet. Uh, it's, it's, they referred to it as sort of like an English rabbit, and it's really a muskrat. And these suckers, or these guys, <laughs> these things are about this big, and they have a tail about this long, and they drag it along the ground. And I have to tell you, if you ever see one, you think it's a big rat. About two or three years ago, I took one off the road that had been run over uh, by someone uh, close to my home. And uh, again, uh, the people who promote California. Uh, propose a ground squirrel as a cooney. Now, whether or not you think it looks like a cooney or, or, or a big rat, it's up to you. But they use other animals too, but none of them look like a muskrat. Another one is there has been no answer for, for the, uh, the snowy plover, which in the quotes it talks about the, the, uh, the, the birds would not get off their nest once they laid an egg. Uh, <laughs> I think that's funny, laid an egg. Hopefully I didn't lay one here. Uh, but uh, after they laid an egg, and that's what the snowy plover does. It just stays on its nest until it's hatched. And they're in the Halen Bay. In fact, they've been reintroduced because they haven't been there since 1950s. And the state of Oregon has closed the Halen uh, spit uh, because uh, of, uh, of, uh, pe of people disturbing the nest and the birds. I already said that. And then here's, a, here's, here's one of the other fine things. It says not far from, from these uh, islands uh, were certain islands we called St. James Islands because it was the day they left, which was in the journal it talks about July 23rd, but that was in the old calendar. The new calendar is, is uh, August 2nd. And so here is the th what's called the three arch rocks now, and that was determined in 19... Uh, and the reason why uh, they, they made it into a refuge was because people were coming down to the coast and sailing out there and just shooting the, the seals and the birds for fun. And so the, uh, the Audubon Society got it uh, set up as a, a national wildlife refuge. And here's another interesting thing. If I, right above, and I'm gonna, next slide will show it too, but I just wanted to show you. Right above that is, is Neocony Mountain. So you can see these islands from Neocony Mountain or in the Halem Bay, not far. It's not like the Farlands, which are far out, as we say. <laughs> I think that's great. And then the Three Arch Rocks, you can see this is from Neocony Mountain, which is 19 miles south. And it's very easy to see. And there's a, there's a Google map that shows you how far away it is, too. And then we're talking about the islands not far. We're talking about cliffs and white banks. We're talking about entering the house like a steeple and round and like and they come out through the center of the top not a teepee not out the front okay like longhouses later on but out of the top and there's one of these in the British Columbia Museum and then the Spanish uh, language for Wapato 
or Salish language for a pontu. The finest down. Waterproof baskets, which says in the journal. It doesn't say feather proof or feathered, covered with all these feathers. That was done by a Pomo Indian, and they were in about the 1930s or 40s. Uh, the, the snowy plover, the co coney, coney. Large fat deer, large uh, herds of fat deer. Well, fat deer or elk. elk. We still have hundreds of elk in, in Oregon. Uh, yes, you do have elk over there at, at Point Reyes. It's a herd of about 17 or 18 right now because that's all it can really support. And then trees without leaves. All these cofers, cofers, conifers. Thank you, dear. I knew she was going to correct me. That's why I did that. <laughs> Those are trees without leaves. <laughs> But you don't have much to wave here. And this is this is one of the the uh, depositions that John Drake, uh, Drake's cousin, gave to the Spanish Inquisition in 1584. It says we actually went uh, and spent a month here, and he called this area uh, New England, named it New England, and it was at 48 degrees. Well, yes, because that's where they were up to. And here, um, Thomas Blundenville. A lot of people don't know about Thomas Blundenville. He wrote, a, he wrote a sixth, uh, sixth treatise in, called The Exercises in 1594. He was a contemporary of Drake's. And he says that by you, one of the treatises was the use of the globe. And he identified, I don't know if you all can read, see that that far. Can you see 46 degrees? You know, that's not 38. So he was a contemporary of Drake's. He knew. And there are some additional points of Drake's three quarters mile Indians. Indians, heavy objects up and down hills, cliffs like Plymouth, very similar to Plymouth. Uh, the, the black staffs that the Indians had, which were five feet, which I've seen at the Smithsonian. Uh, the Indian houses, the dress, the canoes. They had canoes that would carry up to 40 men, believe it or not. And the, the ones that were out here were just balsa canoes carrying one person with double-sided paddles. The paddles in, in the, uh, up in north were, were single-side patterns. The Indian customs, which were uh, potlatches, which were parties. You give someone something, you give twice as much back. Uh, the survey, the, economy met, or the uh, navigation methods, the topography, and there's, there's even more. But we don't have a lot of time. So now we go on in 2023, while well, Oregon continues to rightfully and respectfully gain its history. And now I think I'm supposed to go sit over there. Is that right, Ron? <laughs> Wonderful, Gary. Terrific. Thank you. Very thoughtful uh, presentation. So <laughs> let me ask you, um, what percent of your working, let's say people work 2,000 hours a year, what percent of your working time is spent pursuing some form of Drake issue or history or another? Probably four hours a day. Four hours for, a day. For, for 30 years. So 1,000, yeah, so 1,000 hours times. Thousands. Yeah, 1,000 hours Thousands. a year for 30 years or so. So that would be 30,000 hours or so on the subject. Right. Um, and who is the most credible authority on, in your eyes, the single most credible authority on where Drake landed on the uh, North American coast? Humbly me. <laughs> and, and, and I've been, I, I have that in writing by a gentleman named Bob Ledoux who was the uh, PhD, and he was the editor of the Washington University uh, 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 Journal for a number of years, and he was also the former uh, dean at Marquette University uh, in literature. Somehow we imagined that would be your answer. <laughs> Never ask a question <laughs> when you don't know the answer. So the next question is, uh, I want everybody to understand uh, Drake's purpose. What was his purpose? He was a privateer. Tell everybody what a privateer did. Uh, that's someone who tries to pick up as much treasure as he can uh, because when he was in uh, the first, his first command in 19, or 1563 was with his uh, cousin uh, John uh, Hawkins and at San Yula, uh, they were permitted to anchor and repair their ships after having a, hit a storm. And uh, there were five ships then. And uh, uh, the viceroy from Spain shows up and decided that 
by the way, uh, Drake, no Englishman was allowed to land in, in the New World, and they also excluded lawyers. Just want to let you know about that thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the Viceroy decided to attack them, and he did attack them. Three of their ships were lost. Uh, Hawkins made it back. Drake's made it back. But Drake did lose his uh, uh, brother, one of his brothers, and all his, all his uh, cargo. And he tried to get it back, but uh, never could get it back. So he really pretty much disliked the king. So was a, was a privateer licensed by a sponsoring government to basically steal all they could as they rampaged around the globe? Oh, that's pretty much the way it worked at the time. Yeah, that was, yeah there was nothing uh, out of the ordinary there. The Spanish were allowed to do that. The, the English were allowed to do that. The French were allowed to do that. The Dutch, to a certain extent, were allowed to do that. That was a common, common thing to do. And so stepping back for just an overall kind of global perspective, he starts where, and he sails across the Atlantic, and he comes, where does he start? Where, is his, where does he leave? From London? They leave, no, they leave from Plymouth. They leave from Plymouth, yeah, yeah. England, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then they sail down underneath South America. Did he go into the Caribbean first? Uh, sometimes they would. Um, and be, you have to remember one thing, though. I'm more concerned about his, after he's rounded Cape Horn. Right, I'm going to get to that. And I have, I have read the journal a number of times, and I obviously I have an, a bit of history about that. Uh, and I could probably... Uh, talk about that too, but I'm not the I'm not interested in that so much. I, I, I'm sorry. So <laughs> as he came up, the, as he came up the South American coast and up the Central American coast, right. um, what was his? I heard that his practice was to go into a port and to basically um, uh, entertain and have a party and and find smart navigators and get those navigators. What would he do? Would he steal from the Spaniards? How did he get the the treasure that he gradually accumulated in his voyage? Well, there's a number of, of places that he did stop, and there's a number of different ways that he did get the, his treasure. Uh, one was uh, there was a, there was a man sleeping on the uh, shoreline, and he happened to have um, x spot x x number of of, of uh, bars of silver, and they just took them. Okay, uh, there was another time where they actually went into one of the uh, ports and. Uh, and uh, uh, went on the land and and pillaged pillaged the uh, the uh, city and uh, pillaged the church mm -hmm. uh, and that's where he got uh, the uh, the um, one of the crosses that he had and one of the in fact that's that's one of the things he gave to one of the men who cite, cited the Cacafugo or what there's different names they use for that but the treasure ship that was going into Panama uh, and. Uh, and the first first uh, sailor that spotted that ship, he gave that, that cross to in the chain. And uh, they pillaged that one. And he ended up with a total of, tw they say, 28 tons of silver and five chests of plate. And uh, I honestly, well, silver, we all know what that is. But t tons were not 2,000 pounds. They were 42-gallon uh, barrels. Okay. And that's what, that's what a ton was to them at that time. And because uh, his ship was only 100 feet long. Uh, that's how he was able to get uh, 20, 24, 28 tons of silver. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, the chests of plate, well, that's also uh, uh, gold and uh, uh, coins. And, and unfortunately, if you talk to the Point uh, Reyes uh, Museum over there, they're saying it was porcelain plates. No, sorry. He did take some porcelain pieces, uh, and there have been a few porcelain pieces found in a, a, a neighboring bay south of Nahalem Bay called Neetarts Bay. Um, and uh, Herb Beals, which is mentioned in my book, and Harvey Steele, actually, which is men mentioned in my book, they did a, a, a couple of uh, uh, reports on that those porcelain pieces, too, by the way. So... So you referred to James Delgado. He's, of course, a previous Wednesday Yachting Luncheon speaker. Mm. So he's a heck of a source to claim that your thesis yeah. is, is correct. But back to Drake uh, going up the coast. So how far would he tend to go before he'd pull into? Would he go to the next big city, the next small town, port, uh, a seaport? Where? How, how did he choose to go ashore? I think you all, being, being sailors, would probably know he was thirsty. He needed a little water. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, I noticed sailing or flying over uh, uh, Drake's Bay just yesterday uh, that I could not see any place where they were getting uh, uh, fresh, fresh water. water. Maybe there is, uh, because I don't know. But I will tell you, uh, Nahalem Bay has a river going through it and it's all fresh water. And then there's also called uh, Alder Creek, which is right near his, his campsite. 
Uh, and uh, if you all knew where this campsite was, I did show it on there, but I didn't tell you where it was. Uh, there's fresh water running right by it. So that's the reason why they were looking for fresh water. And he, ha he, he ran into a, a storm. And we have lots of storms. We had a storm when I left yesterday. We still have storms up there right now. And we have them in, in, June, in June, too, when he was there. And uh, he needed to repair his ship. So he's looking for a place to repair his ship. So when, when he was stealing from the Spaniards, who were the folks who had the treasure to steal from, yeah. um, uh, were they, did they start chasing him? Well, let's see. Did they chase did him? Did they chase him up the coast? No. Okay. So why does he keep going north? He was looking for the short way home. He was looking for the way around uh, the top of the world over uh, North America. And they call that uh, Annie, Annie and at that time, A-N-I-N-A-N -N or something. So like he that. kept hunting for the Northwest Passage. Yes. That's your thesis? He yes. kept going north for that purpose? Yes. And actually, uh, Blundenville, who I mentioned, said that he actually left his ship in, uh, to be repaired in the Halem Bay and took Tallow's Bark, which he had confiscated down in Nicaragua. A, a two-masted ship or a one-masted ship, it only depends what you consider bark. Uh, and they actually went up that way, and that's where they ran into the really cold weather, too. And they left the bark in the Halem Bay, I have to tell you, somewhere off in the Halem Bay. Uh, but uh, that's the reason why he was looking for the North, Northwest Passage. Now, advocates who believe that he landed in Drake's Bay claim that he went into Drake's Bay, it was shallow, and he healed his boat over and uh, repaired the copper, yeah. replaced copper on the bottom. Yeah. So talk to us about what's wrong with that thesis. Uh, well, I don't. I don't believe they said they mentioned copper. Copper okay. came along later on in about the 1700s. That's what sometime. I was getting to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what they what they needed to do was put uh, put the caulking back in or the rope back in between the between the uh, uh, seams seams and then tar it. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, uh, Portis Noby, I'll, I'll be honest. If you notice, uh, it has two different places where they have uh, uh, Indians having fire. Uh, that wasn't necessarily for the ship. That was also for beacons, safety beacons. They were watching uh, to make sure that the Spanish were not coming along uh, and looking for them. And that, those, were, those were warning beacons. So, wait a second. I asked earlier if you thought the Spanish were chasing him northward because one of our previous speakers suggested that's why he kept constantly wanted to keep moving because he had the Spaniards chasing him from the thiever he'd committed south of here. I don't think he was worried about that. See, now we're into conjecture because I wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it doesn't it. say that. You were there. Yeah. Wait. No, I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but see, I don't do conjecture. But, but I will say that it, it made more sense that he was looking for the Northwest Passage, and he had a faster ship than any of the other ones. Uh -huh. And the ones that could have caught him, he burned. But he never killed anyone. Uh -huh. uh, cabin issue came on later on, just threw the people overboard, unfortunately. Uh -huh. uh, and so, anyway. Why was his ship faster? Um, well... You know, <laughs> all I know is when he was chasing the, uh, the treasure ship, he had to throw out a barrel uh, so that he could slow down, so that he could look more like a Spanish ship and slow down. Uh -huh. So uh, he was much faster for that reason. Uh -huh. So that's the best I could give you, because it really doesn't say in the journal why he was faster. Now, Columbus had, a sh had three ships in his party, and other folks yeah. had multiple ships. What about Drake? He had five to start off with. Um, he lost some going through the uh, uh, um, Magellan Strait, and uh, one went home, and one he tore apart uh, for the for the for the goods that were there, you know, the sails and the rope and things. And the other one he waited uh, in uh, South America for it and never showed up. The other mm -hmm. one, so. And so the Golden Hind was, uh, you said, 100 feet long? Yeah, roughly. Give us, give us the dimensions of the Golden Hind for what you know of. 100 feet long. How uh, wide? How, what's the beam? Well, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm not a, a sailor. I don't know if you've figured that out or not. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do know it drew nine feet. And the Halen Bay had more than nine feet. In, in the Halen Bay to get through it at the time. And I have had some people say, oh, no, that, but I have old, old maps. Well, old, old, old. You know, the Church. territory of the Halen Bay was only, only uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, people came to live there until about the 1850s. So all the, all the history is right on top of the, the ground there. So this isn't anything that's like, you know, you have to dig for. Now, so as much. fun it is for me to ask questions, we want everybody else to have a chance, too. Uh, David, David James. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your remarks. I really have enjoyed them. My question is, 
those of us who are local sailors race up and back to Drake's Bay every year, are you telling me he never went there? And if so... Drake's Bay? How did it get the name? Oh, well, I, if, you, if you would have read the, uh, the preamble that I sent out, I'm sorry, maybe you didn't get a chance to, but George Davidson actually named it. George Davidson was the U.S. Uh, geodesic surveyor at the time. Oddly, he was from England, too. But uh, he was 25 years old when he was doing this. And so he's the one named Drake Spay. He had to. He had to put it someplace. It's a good question. So, so David, we have the same feeling. I've raced at Drake Spay, you know, probably even won the Drake Spay race, have a tray at home with, uh, you know, first place on it. And I'm so devastated by the fact that <laughs> Francis Drake, my hero, be. of all these years. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. What do you think I've been living with? <laughs> Actually, if it makes you feel any so, better, if it makes you feel any better, the Drake Navigators... I, I believe that. I, I knew Ed Vonderport, the, the president of the Drake Navigators Guild, for quite some time, and he's the one that said that the Halen Bay was too big. But the point is, is that they have been they have been promoting the internet over uh, over Nahalem Bay and putting us on the on the fringe page of New Albion and closing up the Francis Drake uh, site on Wikipedia that you can't even post on. And that was originally was done by the the administrator who is now the president of the Drake Navigators Guild. And I'm sorry did I say that. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like sour grapes, but uh, don't pay attention to Wikipedia. That's all I can say. <clears throat> now, just to help everybody stay uh, tuned, give us the essence of your argument. Summarize it in three bullet points. Why did he land in Oregon, not California? Evidence point one, two, and three. Uh, Edward Wright's world map, or world chart, with the Queen's... Queen's privy seal on it. Uh, what year was that? Uh, 1599 and then 1600. Um, the language, which is Pata, which is the Salish language for Wapatu. In fact, Lewis and Clark named one of the islands off of uh, Portland there Wapatu Island at one time because there's it, it grew so much uh, and it's uh, and, and so you can't deny the language. What, but the language meaning Drake said this is a language that they were speaking. It's in. written in the journal, Pata, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. They were eating that that mm -hmm. that with it, that they <clears throat> baked and, and they ate it raw or baked, and it was sweet. And uh, and the third thing would be the size of the bay itself and the 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 the, 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 the three quarters the, of a mile uh, across the and the topography <clears throat> of the bay. It matches the Halem's Bay. In fact, uh, someone said that John Drake, uh, well, actually, it says in the journal that John Drake was drawing the shorelines uh, all along the West Coast so that others could find their way back there. In fact, that's one of the reasons why they did the survey, too, so their people could find it. In fact, in fact Cook looked for Nova Albion at 45 degrees. He was told by the, by the, uh, the chief... That's evidence point number four. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. I like your summary. It's great. That is the case with people who have exhaustive encyclopedic knowledge of a subject. It's important to just get a quick summary. Yeah. That's a very good and compelling summary. Thank okay, you. we have some naysayers, I bet. No, she's not a naysayer. <laughs> que <laughs> questions from the audience again. <laughs> questions from the audience. If you, have a, if you have a question from the audience, hold your hand up and the mic we brought to you. Bruce Monroe usually has intelligent things to say. Bruce. <laughs> so at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the fact that Queen Elizabeth destroyed all the records of the voyage, including, I assume, Drake's ship's log, which would, of course, be the best evidence of where he had been. Can you tell us why she did that? Well, Actually, she didn't destroy them. It never says that she destroyed them. She only collected them. And there's been some, some uh, theories that because of the Whitehall, which is where uh, she was really living at the time, uh, had been burnt, burnt a couple of times, that they may have been lost in that location. So no one, ever had, no one has ever seen them since they were collected from Drake, other than... Uh, Helen Wallace, the map director at the at the uh, British Library, said that that the journal was a bit edited, believe it or not, um, because they changed it from 38 degrees to 38 and a half, and that was like a couple of 
couple of sentences later. So why did they say 38, the 38 and a half? Well, because Viscano uh, was there in 1603 looking for the Sermano's um, cargo. And so because he was there at 38 point and a half, point one, uh, I'm trying to put this in the right vernacular, uh, that's why they went to 38 and a half, because he was one tenth of a degree higher. So they didn't destroy him, and uh, I guess I hopefully that gives you your answer there. Oh, and by the way, it seems that uh, uh, Edward Wright, because he was the Queen's cartographer, having developed the first English maps in 1588, going to the Azores, it appears that he did have access to the, to the, to the um, uh, logbook at one time. That's the reason why on his map that the Oregon and Washington coast is, is tilted, because he used the Mercator projection, which I explained earlier. So what is, when is the earliest reference of 38 degrees in any historic record? Uh, the uh, rolling compass. At what year? 1628. So somebody did say 38 degrees at 1628. Yeah. What is the earliest reference of 48 degrees? Uh, world encompassed. The same, the same, same document. The same document. So yeah. does one reference, that is to say 38 or 48, predate the other? They're, they're both from the no, same No, they're document? both in the same, you know, couple of pages. Okay. Of the 19 pages. Okay. Another question. Yes. Well, Stand up, please. Yeah, oh. Yeah, would you mention your name, please? <laughs> this is your sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't quite remember the details, but I think it would be interesting if you could point out how I think the Drake Navigators Guild, in their publications, had to turn the map in order to try to match the image on the back of the book, which is the Nehemiah oh, map. Yeah, you mean the guild? The, is their that ma who their it was? maps? Well, I yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that they had to turn it. They turned it. Yeah, they had to turn it. Uh, well, Keep it wasn't 100, it wasn't 180 degrees, but it was, uh, you know, let's just call it 100. And so wait, well explain, over 90. explain her question to us. Well, if you notice the. And thank uh, you for the question. Yeah, if you notice the uh, the page that I had where the where I said ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> I feel kind of embarrassed of that, but that was the that was the book that I originally had when I first read it, and I just looked at that and I just laughed at it. And, and I have a habit of writing in in books that just don't make any sense. And what they did was they took the the uh, uh, Portus Novi Albionis and turned it not 90, but not 180, but close to 180 degrees. Whereas to match Nehalem Bay, all I have to do is just lay it lay it right over the top of it, and it's right there. In fact, it's right over. It's right in the back of my book. By the way, feel free to buy this. You know, authors don't make a lot of money, you know. <laughs> so now we have four books here, by the way. This is your first book. Yes. And you've got, you you attempt to create the new historic record by putting the map you propose is where Drake landed right on the cover of your book. Uh, yes. Clever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Actually, a friend of mine took uh -huh. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. From there. Perfect. Um, <laughs> this is fascinating. Wonderful. And. Uh, you suggest that this matches, that is to say, topographically, this bay matches way better than Drake's Bay. Absolutely. Okay. 100%. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, and then your second book. Um, talk to us about your second book, The Oregon Land Claim. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of guilty of, uh, of, of taking, taking the portion of the navigation out of that book and made it into another book. Uh, okay. Because not everyone can afford forty dollars for a book, and maybe they're interested in navigation, and it's only twenty dollars. The same thing with the Indians too. Uh, okay. The, 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 all the Indian information, most of it is out of this. I, by the way, I am. Oh, and then this one here, you're going to ask me about this one, I'm sure. Yes. And this is about the other right world chart, and this one here actually was in the. Uh, I don't. I no longer have the copyright on this. I had. A, I had to release the copyright to to uh, port uh, to. Uh, uh, God. <laughs> Help me, Peg. Help me, help me. Uh, yeah, the publisher on this. Uh, who? No, Lulu? She's no, asking? no, no, no. No, this was done in a double-blind peer review uh, journal okay. uh, in, Great. out of England. And uh, it was, I had to give, give away the copyright, but I could do this because this is only the, the pre-copy. And so, and it was, what was it? Was it Terra Incognita? Thank you. Terra Incognita. Okay. And it's the Journal of the Society for the History of Discoveries. And it's probably the number two uh, journal in the, in the world, uh, if you read about it. And it's done by uh, a ta uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor and uh, 
Taylor and I can't remember the first next, next publisher. So how old was Drake when he was going up the coast? They really don't know. They think he was about 42 or so. Uh-huh. You know, because they really don't know what year. Is it born. true that when he got back to England, he was essentially the richest person in England aside from the crown? Well, he, he, when he gave the, the, the uh, treasure to the queen, it was uh, something like, if I remember, something like three or four years of the national... Budget. Budget, thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I sort of remember. But again, uh, you know, I'm not the expert on it. So we that. don't know if he was the richest person, but he was darn close to it? Yeah, he bought himself a nice house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Ron, I have a question. Yes, Bert, David, thank you. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Uh, so my question is this. So you mentioned the Mercator projection. All of us who are sailors yeah. or navigators or what have you are familiar with that. So prior to the Mercator projection, you had Nunes from I'm Portugal? So, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, prior what to what? was before Mercator? Oh, what, what uh, was it was a plane chart navigation. Mercator. They were just doing plane chart navigation. And so plane chart was. Could you explain that? Well, I'm it's, sorry. it's well as we know, the further north you go, right now, the the shorter the the latitudes get. Okay. Right. But when you but in those days, uh, they really hadn't configured or configured or, or thought about it, and so that they had to make it flat to be able to th for them to understand it. So making it flat said 60 degrees uh, latitudes and 60 degrees longitudes. And that's pretty much everything was set up that way as, as plain, it's called plane chart navigation. So yeah. it didn't account for the horizontal dimension getting smaller as you get to the that's, top of the that's globe. That's correct, right. And that only came about with the Mercator projection. In well, fact, just to mention one more thing, in 1599, Edward Wright uh, released his book, Certain Errors of Navigation certain errors in, in navigation and uh, I don't at the top at the top of my head I don't remember the exact uh, paragraph but it tells you how to how to uh, uh, make a survey uh, and so you'll have to read the book to remember how to do that <laughs> so so uh, students at the topic who want to learn more about this subject would go to your name G A R R Y, right. last name G I T Z E N. Yes. Uh, dot yeah. com or what? Yeah, or you can look it, look it up on uh, uh, nahalentel dot net, which is my website. Uh, we did have another website, but honestly, I have been doing so much for so long, and all these passwords and all these r companies being resold uh, from 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 GoDaddy to. To, uh, to to from Wick, from Wick, Weebly uh, to uh, Microsoft, uh, I've I've lost uh, all those passwords for one of our websites, and Neocani uh, or, or Nahalem dot net uh, is uh, maybe going away. I don't know because I haven't done anything with it because I can't keep up with that stuff. So, uh, but, but you can go to um, you can go to Amazon and you can find some of my books. Your books, great. And you can go to Academia EDU and you can find a lot of my uh, articles that I've posted. And uh, and I've also have uh, manuscripts that, that haven't been released. Uh, I have a manuscript called Oregon Stolen History and it outlines all the things that I mentioned about the about the uh, uh, California, <coughs> excuse me, California uh, 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 Resource Commission. Uh, it outlines all of that. And uh, so there's a lot more there. That's one of so, the things I sent to uh, to Miss Miss Smith in, in UK. So what's the date of the first mention of Halem Bay, historically? Who de who decides for the first time that Halem Bay might have been Drake's location? Uh, well, Wayne Jensen, uh, who was the director of the Tillamook Museum, uh, theorized that Drake had made a survey on the Yukonia Mountain. And what year uh, would that be? Uh, 1971. I have a map, a large map, that they actually had Spanish uh, si uh, varas and, and English uh, um, uh, language. And then finally, and they figured out that it was because when they found the mon uh, measurement rock of 36 inches, they said, it's English. And so they crossed off on this map all the Spanish information. It's a big map. Yeah. And it's original. So 19, in the 70s is the first time this yeah. in Healing Bay gets mentioned. Yeah. And it, and you looked at that source and then began to research that authenticity? 
and whether or not it made sense that this would be the location rather than Drake's Bay. Yeah, when he died in 2005, he gave me his library and his research papers. And I, I read in the paper that he said, if we ever proved that Drake was here, and I thought we had, but he never really wrote much. If Actually, uh, you know, in the loose, loose uh, vernacular, the, the, the thing that I passed out previously, you can almost call it a chapbook, and that's, what, that's all that Wayne ever wrote was a chapbook. You take eight and a half... Uh, sheets and, uh, and you fold them in half, put a staple in it, and you end up with uh, eight or ten pages. And it's called chapbook with C H A P lower C. And so, and, and I even wrote one of those, and it was all wrong, but for the most part. But, but anyway, yeah. yeah so. so Gary, thank you for sharing your exhaustive research, and um, it's been a real fun and authentic discussion with what we would consider a genuine amateur historian. You remember that uh, the seven cities of Troy were discovered by an amateur archaeologist, Heinrich Schliemann, and uh, archaeology owes a lot to amateurs. Oh, One yeah. of our own past speakers is a member of this yacht club. He was the first to discover, you know, um, big giant whale bones in Bakersfield. And uh, it's been fun listening to your premise. It's pretty compelling. And uh, thanks very much for being our guest. Yes. I would like to say one final thing. Yes. Uh, because I'm getting older, I'm 76. I gave uh, 85% or 90% of my papers and, and books to the Columbia River Maritime Museum. Great. Because that's Oregon's uh, official uh, uh, maritime museum. So just if anyone wants to find additional information, call them. Good. Uh, they have the books. But we don't want you to stop researching oh, and writing. Not. We <laughs> want you to keep at it a thousand hours a year. You know, we I'm want infected. more. <laughs> Thanks very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. Thank you Good very much. Gary. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.